الله وسلم وبارك على عبده ورسوله الأمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن اهتدى بهديه واستنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته In continuation to yesterday's part one of the signs of the day of judgment we stopped at wishing death and the more you see people wishing to die this is a sign of the approaching of the day of judgment why because the prophet told us alayhi salatu wasalam that the hour would not be called until a man passes by a grave of a dead person and wishes that he was in his place. Of course, this happens due to trials, wars, calamities. And so many times I hear this personally from people wishing to have been dead and they wish to die. And this by itself is not permissible in Islam. The Prophet said, عليه الصلاة والسلام, لا يتمنى أحدكم الموت لضر مسا. One must not wish for death because he is tested by Allah with hardship. Yet, if you were to wish for death, you have to have it conditional. What do we mean by conditional? You say, Oh Allah, if death is good for me, make it happen. And if life is good for me, make me live longer. So this is conditional. You're not just simply asking for death, but you are putting a condition that Allah Azza wa Jal has told us about. Also, part of the signs of the Day of Judgment is the spreading of murders and killing. And nowadays, we see this a lot. The Prophet was addressing his companions once and said, ahead of the hour is the spreading of killing. So the companion said, more than we do now, we kill approximately 70,000, meaning of the kuffar. And again, like we've mentioned before, 70,000 is an expression of a lot, exaggeration, but it is not a exact figure. So the Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, told them, no, it is not killing of the idol worshippers. It is killing one another. Jazakallahu khayran. Barakallahu khayran. Take this and it takes. Thanks. So the companions objected. We kill one another? Do we have our brains in our heads? And the Prophet said, no, the brains of the people of that era would be taken out, meaning that they would not have minds, they would not have intellect. And all what would remain are the scum of the people. And they believe that they are on the right track, but they are not. If you look at this hadith, at what we are seeing nowadays, you find that it fits like a glove. Explain to me the killings that we find in Shia mosques. When you blow a Husayniya or a mosque, killing hundreds and thousands of Shia, but they're innocent. Children, women, worshippers, though they are deviant and wrong sect on Balala, maybe in hellfire, no one justifies killing them. Explain to me the killing that happens in places like Syria. Barrels of explosive thrown and people dying. Indiscriminate killing. We believe if there is a mistake here or there, yeah, maybe it can be tolerated, but when you target women and children, 
and innocent people like in Iraq, like in Afghanistan, like in Libya, like in Yemen, like here and there. Where is Islam? So this, and the sad thing is that it happens without any remorse. The push of a button. Wallah, we killed today 500 people. That's all. Yalla, inshallah, tomorrow we will try to increase the number. And the killing happens for your wallet, for your watch. Maybe people kill one another because of road rage. He passed me and he looked at me and I stop him, we fight, I stab him, he dies. This happens in Saudi a lot. Not a lot, but it happens. What causes this to happen? The approach of the day of judgment. The Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, Ummati Ummatun Marhumah. My Ummah is a blessed Ummah. Allah will have mercy upon them. There will not be torment and punishment for my Ummah on the Day of Judgment. Their torment and punishment is in this dunya. Through trials, fitan, earthquakes, and killing. This is the punishment of Ummah Muhammad is the spread of killing, earthquakes, and fitan. The Prophet ﷺ warned us that shirk will rise before the Day of Judgment. So now we are comfortable that we are Muslims and Islam is widely being spread. I get SMSs and I get uh, on the mobile phone in the WhatsApp posts saying that Islam in Canada is so and so, in Europe, in uh, um, uh, UK, in Germany, and by 2030 or 2050, Islam will dominate it, and people are happy with this. Well, the Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, that the day of judgment would not come until groups of my ummah will follow the idol worshippers and will worship the idols themselves. Abu Hurairah said, the Prophet said alayhi salatu wasalam, that hour would not be called until the women of Daus, it's a tribe in Arabia. One of the most prominent members of this tribe of Daus is Abu Hurairah himself. And it's now called Bani Zahran. So if you hear someone know by the name of Az Zahrani, he's from Daus. It's a, it's a big tribe. The Prophet said that the hour would not be called until women go round the idol of Dil Khulsa. It's an idol that used to be worshipped in Jahiliya time. It would be revived and people from that tribe from Arabia, 300 kilometers away from Mecca, will worship it. Now, when you look at this, form of worshipping idols, nowadays you will not find this so visible, but you will find people turning to other idols. No one puts Buddha and starts to worship, or Krishna, or uh, uh, whatever idols they have. But you will find people worshipping among the Muslims their desires and whims. We find among the youth few numbers of atheists. And people, I, I sat with many of them and I speak to them. Dr. Zakir Naik went to Indonesia two years ago. When he came back, I was talking to him. He said it was a very successful visit. And I have never seen atheists in my life like I've seen there. I was shocked. 250 million Muslims, the largest country in the world with Muslim population. And this is what you're saying? He said, yes. Most of the youth I meet, their parents are doctors, engineers, professors. The people, their sons or daughters, they come and say, MashaAllah, doctor, your lecture was fabulous. 
but I'd like to tell you that I am not a Muslim. My father is Muslim, my mother is Muslim, but I am a free thinker. He says, I spend with them two to five minutes. And the man says the Shahada and accepts Islam. He said that I didn't know that Islam was like this. What is a free thinker? There is nothing as a free thinker. There is a hypocrite who hates Islam. So when you fee find people like this nowadays, these are part of the idol worshippers that the Prophet told us you, that the groups of his ummah would follow that. But the idol they're worshipping is their own selves, their desires and whims. There isn't anything as atheism in Islam. People want to destroy Islam, so they pretend to be free thinkers, be uh, people of nature, etc., just to uh, undermine Islam. Part of the signs of the Day of Judgment, which the Prophet told us about, والسلام, is the existence of obscenity and vulgar talk and vulgar actions as well. Also bad neighboring. These are all mentioned in an authentic hadith. And nowadays, this is obvious. In times of Jahiliyyah, in the early times of Islam, people's talk were clean. You don't find people swearing or using obscene words and language. Nowadays, due to the media, due to rap music, due to movies, all what people do is curse. And most of those who are polite, they would say, he used the F word. What do you want? And they said S word when he was cursing something. To say about someone who's black, he used the N word. What, what is this? The initials of him. But this is what's happening among the Muslims. When they drop something, they say the F word. When they say something, the S word. And until their death comes and they're prevented from saying La ilaha illallah. Their tongues are not moist with dhikrullah. So if you're driving and then there, there comes a car, an 18-wheeler that's going to crash you and crush you. Definitely you're dying. What are you going to say? La ilaha illa or the mother F. This is what happens because this is what we say. Now, I am shocked in some Muslim households, you find that the father is cursing his son by saying, may Allah curse your father. Allah al anabuk. Who's his father? <laughs> I'm his father. The usages of dog, donkey, uh, monkey, this is normal between siblings. In my house, this is totally prohibited. And I don't remember saying this to any of my children for maybe three or four decades, alhamdulillah. Because we bring up ourselves, cleanse our hearts, cleanse our mouths from speaking such foul language, let alone any sexual implica implications or yeah, any, uh, uh, words here or there. Nowadays, this is not possible. Because this is what you see, this is what you hear, this is what everyone around you uses. And this is why the Prophet warned us from that. Bad neighboring. Look at your neighbors. When was the last time you visited them? You greeted them. I remember 20, 30 years ago, whenever in the neighborhood, one of the neighbors would, his wife would give birth the full community would organize dinner and lunch, dinner and lunch. So today, lunch is on my family. They cook food and we take it to them, they eat. The woman doesn't work. There is a bond. Nowadays, we live in cement houses. Maybe in the same building, you don't know who your neighbors are. They move in, they move out. I don't know them. And this is problematic. 
And what is even worse is when you harm your neighbor. This is a catastrophe. Wallahi la yu'min. Wallahi la yu'min. Wallahi la yu'min. The Prophet said three times, by Allah, he is not a believer. Who is that? The Prophet said, the one whose neighbor is not safe from his harm. If I throw my garbage in front of his house, if I take his parking spot, if I raise the volume of t TV or music that annoys him, if I do things that would not be considered as the actions of a good neighbor, then we have a problem. Among the signs mentioned in an authentic hadith, the Prophet says, the appearance of landslides and transformations or transmutations and stones from the heaven. This will come. Landslides happen every time. These are minor signs because there will be three major landslides. We will talk about this as part of the 10 major uh, signs of the Day of Judgment. The famous landslide that took place mentioned in the Quran was hmm? Qarun. Qarun is said to have been a cousin of Musa, nothing authentic, but he was a contemporary of Musa and he was not like Haman. Haman was the minister of Pharaoh, but Qarun was a businessman. Yet he was so filthy rich that he overlooked the favors and blessings of Allah Azza wa Jal. And as mentioned in the chapter of Al Qasas, he was walking happy proud of what he had Allah Azza wa Jal made the earth cave and he there was a landslide and it swallowed him we see landslides in Europe in UK in America and we see houses being swallowed but on a very small scale we will see a lot of this coming in the future and one of them one of the prominent ones other than the three mentioned would be an army coming to invade the Kaaba. And it has to be known that no one invades the Kaaba except the Muslims. The last of them were, was Abraha from Abyssinia. This is when the Prophet was born, Allah protected the house. He sent Tayran Ababil, as you know the story. But later on, all those who invade or try to invade the Kaaba are Muslims. Whether real Muslims or pretending to be the Muslims as we have so many of them. So the Prophet says, if you hear of an army that Allah Azza wa Jal makes a landslide and swallows the whole army, then anticipate the hour. Meaning that this is a clear sign of its coming. So there will be such a thing. And also the Prophet told us that to anticipate this happening when there are musical instruments being played everywhere, concerts. And specifically women singing. And women singers are everywhere and literally everywhere so this is a very bad sign that it is happening the prophet والسلام, even warned anas ibn malik and this is a prophecy from him والسلام, and he said anas soon the people will divide empty lands and award it to others. You know when you have a big land and you <coughs> chop it into blocks and, and plots and you sell it. So he tells him, Oh Anas, people will soon do this. In a place called Al-Basra. Where is Al-Basra? In Iraq. 
And this happened at the time of Umar. So this prophecy was seen by Anas. So the Prophet says, والسلام, if you ever pass by it or enter it, avoid its sabakh. A sabakh is the land filled with salt. No, no, salt, salty land. You cannot have crops there. And we have this here a lot in Kuwait. We have this in the Mam, in this area which is close to the sea or where the sea has gone away from it. So avoid Sibakhiha wa kila'iha. Kila'iha is the docking places where the rivers or the sea. And avoid its markets and where the princes and governors live. And you have to go to the suburbs. Abahia is a place which is high. You leave these places, the Prophet is specifically telling, leave these places of Basra and go and live there. Why? The Prophet says, because there will be landslides, there will be stoning from the heavens and there will be trembles, shaking, earthquakes, and there will be people going to bed as humans waking up to be transmutilated into monkeys and pigs. We haven't seen that, but we believe in it and it will happen. And this should be a very big eye opener to people when they say humans turning into apes and swines, but still the Kafir will be a Kafir. The believer will increase his belief. Among the signs that the Prophet told us والسلام, is the existence and the reign of Al-Qahtani. Al-Qahtan, Banu Qahtan is a big tribe in Arabia. And they are part of the oldest tribes of Arabia. And the name Al-Qahtani, I think you have a lot of it here. This man will reign and will rule and would move the people as the Prophet described him with his stick. Some say that he's abusive. Others say, no, he's disciplining people and making them follow orders. And this is why a lot of the scholars believe that he is a righteous caliph who would reign and rule and would... What shall we just for... And uh, this, is, this was not mentioned in the signs of the Day of Judgment, but I'm <laughs> afraid of the cameras and the wiring. So this, this person, Qahtani, is other than the Jah Jah that the Prophet told us who would come and attack and would rule. This one is part of the slave. And he's not the Abyssinian who would come and demolish the Kaaba stone by stone. This would come really at the end of time. This is a righteous ruler who we are, uh, and he, uh, will maybe here in our lifetime, maybe not. Part of the sad signs of the Day of Judgment is when the Kaaba itself is being invaded. The Prophet told us about Al-Islam, an invasion where there will be a landslide, everyone will die in it. Women, children, servants, and the soldiers. And the companions said, okay, what is the fault of the women and the soldiers? Uh, the women and the children, what did they do, O Prophet of Allah? They were forced to come. The Prophet said they will be resurrected according to their niyyah. So there is no fault on them, inshallah. Another army, would come and invade the Kaaba and it would succeed. So the Prophet said alayhi salatu wasalam, there will come a time when people would give the pledge of allegiance to a man, maybe he is the Qahtani, maybe not, between the Rukul al-Yamani and the Maqam of Ibrahim in the Kaaba, which means that's something good. Then he said, and no one will invade and disrespect the Bayt, the house, the Kaaba, except its people, the Muslims. 
And once they disrespect and invade the Kaaba, do not ask about the destruction of the Arabs. Meaning that that time, khalas, Arabs are no longer uh, existing or doing their job. Then the Prophet says, then afterwards, the Abyssinians, the people of Habasha, will come and they will destroy the Kaaba in a way that it would never ever re be rebuilt again. Which means that this is at the very last thing be uh, before the destruction of this dunya. The Abyssinians will be the ones taking the treasures of the Kaaba. And the Prophet told us and described to us this Abyssinian leader being short, being with crooked feet, and that he is uh, uh, black and that he is destroying it, dismantling it brick by brick. Now one would maybe argue, didn't Allah promise to make this place safe? Allah says, have they not seen that we have made Mecca a sanctuary secure and that men are being snatched away from all around them? Scholars say, yeah, yes, this is ayah, it, it is correct, but it didn't say that this would last forever. And this is why the Prophet said that no one would disrespect and invade the Kaaba except people from the Muslims themselves. And we have so many incidents. For example, we have the incident of the Qaramita, who came from the eastern part, Bahrain, some say Bahrain refers to Al Ihsa. You know where Qatif not, not this Bahrain. Bahrain, this is an, a small island that is nothing compared to the eastern province itself. It used to be called Bahrain. This is where the Qaramita came from. In I think the year 321 Hijri. They came in the season of Hajj, like we are now couple of weeks earlier they went and invaded the haram while the pilgrims were making tawaf slaughtering everyone in their way throwing their dead bodies in the well of zamzam and one of them the leader would come up on the top of kaaba and he says where are the tayr al-ababil and he's mocking the Quran. So Allah sent the birds when Abraha came with the elephant and the birds threw these small stones from Sijil. He's saying, where are the Tayr al-Ababil? And another one said, I execute and annihilate the people. I give them life. And they took down the rain uh, uh, drainage on the Kaaba and they dug out the black stone Hajar Aswad and they took it with them to Al Ahsa listen remaining with them for 20 years the Muslims making Tawaf, making Sa'i, making Umrah, making Hajj for 20 years and they don't have the black stone. It's empty. And they tried so many times to fight them, to get it back. After 21 plus years, they agreed to bring it. And it was restored where it is now. So the Kaaba was invaded. The Kaaba was invaded earlier at the time of Yazid ibn Muawiyah. When Abdullah ibn Zubair May Allah be pleased with him and with, with his father, took power of Mecca, Medina, almost everywhere except Syria. And people gave the Pledge of Allegiance to him as the Amir al-Mu'mineen. But then hypocrites interfered and then powers changed, shifted. They sent an army with the leadership of Al-Hajjaj ibn Yusuf al-Thaqafi who stoned the Kaaba and demolished parts of it until he killed Abdullah ibn Zubayr. 
So Mecca was invaded so many times and it will be invaded later on as the Prophet had said alayhi salatu wasalam. Yet, generally speaking, the security and the sanctuary is still ongoing from that time till the end of time when the Abyssinian man comes and demolishes it totally. Now, part of the greatest signs of the Day of Judgment is the appearance of fitan. Fitan is the plural of fitna. And fitna in Arabic means testing. So you test the gold by burning it. And it can be testing in your wealth, in your health, in your offspring, testing through waging wars, testing through casting doubts about your religion, or testing with desires like fame, wealth, power, and women. So there are so many types of fitan, trials, uh, uh, tests, exams that you have to look into. It's not only torture. Torture is also fitna. Those who tested, tried, and burnt the people of the trench is called testing. So this torture is testing. It has so many different manifestations and ways. The Prophet warned us والسلام, from all of this. He said in an authentic hadith, there was no prophet before me, but it was his duty to tell his ummah of the best of what he knew was good for them and warn them about the worst of what he knew was bad for them. The Prophet says, والسلام, the time of peace and security for this ummah has been made in its first era. Which era? The Prophet's era and the companions. This is the time of peace that uh, uh, was given peace and security. The Prophet says, and it is last era, and its last era will be afflicted with trials and things that you will be confused about. This is fitna. And this is what we are suffering now. He says, a fitna, one thing fitna, will come and the believer will say, this is going to cause my destruction, my doom. Then when it ends, another fitna will come and the believer will say, this is the one. The Prophet says, Asam, whoever would like to be delivered from hell, and enter paradise, let him die believing in Allah and the last day. And let him treat people as he would like to be treated. And whoever gives the pledge of allegiance to his ruler, and he shakes hands with him, and give the, gives him the fruit of his heart, he must obey him. And if another one comes trying to claim to be a ruler, then you have to kill the other one. And in another hadith, the Prophet said, والسلام, ahead of the day of judgment, there will be fitan, trials as dark as night. So dark, so in, at night you're confused, you can't see. The Prophet says, a man wakes up a believer, when night falls, he turns to a kafir. And a man at nightfall, he's a believer, and when he wakes up, he wakes up as a kafir. At this time of fitan, the one who's sitting is better than the one who's standing. The one who's standing is calling others to follow him in fitna. The one who sits is better. And the one standing is better than the one walking. And the one walking is better than the one who is brisk walking. What to do? The Prophet said, Therefore, at such times, break your bows. Cut the strings of your bows. So not only break 
the wood also cut the string and hit your swords by the rocks to break them so if someone enters at you wanting to kill you be like the best of the two sons of Adam don't defend yourself die rather than participate in such fitna and leading others to it now we will not go into discussion of the different types of fitna because this would take a full workshop so many of them and we're surrounded of them Allah Azza wa mentioned that our wealth and our offspring are fitna fitna so the concept of fitna is so wide we will not go into that but the Prophet told us alayhi salatu wasalam that the fitna will come from here and he pointed towards the east and this is where the horns of shaitan now in order to understand this you have to look at the whole picture why do you say this sheikh because a lot of the haters would say that najd as mentioned in the hadith is where the horns of shaitan is and this is where all the fitan come so nowadays najd as we know it is riyadh and the areas around it so you saudis are the cause of all fitan the prophet said najd now i could defend this but still i'm a saudi so you say i can't accept your defense let us be objective show me the number of fitan that came from riyadh <clears throat> i will surrender and say maybe one or two throughout of time maybe three okay let's look at the other side of the coin you say najd is in riyadh i say okay can we see other scholars when we look at the scholars five six seven centuries ago who explained this hadith who did not have anything affiliated with the saudi government a man was asked in an interview what was the nationality of the prophet alayhi salatu was saudi of course it shows you the ignorance of people the nationality of the prophet was what saudi what imbecile would say such a thing so six seven centuries there was no saudi what did the scholars say they said najd to the people of in arabic najd means a high place so uh, um, uh, we, in arabic we call it hababa or a tell or a small mountain in any place that is high it's called najd so to the people of mecca yemen najd for them is riyadh but for the people of medina all scholars say that najd for the people of medina is iraq now compare the amount of fitan that came from iraq and from iran and you will find that there are so many of them let's start with a few kufa where is it in iraq from kufa and the surroundings we get the rafida shia and we get the khawarij nicest and al-qaeda and all the whole nine yards but from an early age and all of them the khawarij and the rafida are extreme in ali one claim him to be a god or a prophet or someone out of this world and the other consider him to be a kafir who deserves to be killed and they sent Abdurrahman ibn Muljim and he assassinated him Khawarij this is what they do the killer of 
Umar ibn Khattab was a Majusi. The fitna of Uthman and his assassination started from Iraq, then went to Egypt, and then it happened. The incident of the camel, Mawqi'at al-Jamal, took place in Iraq. Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, was assassinated in its biggest city, which is the Kufa. Ali fought Muawiyah in Safin, and it was in Iraq. From it came the deviant sects of al Jabriya. Jabriya who claim that everything we do, we're forced to do it. So the Iman of Abu Jahl is equivalent to the Iman of Abu Bakr because both of them are doing what Allah predestined upon them. And al Qadariyah came from there and Qadariyah is the opposite. They said Allah does not create what we do. Allah does not know what we do until we do it. So compare apple to apple. Would you still say that it is from Saudi Arabia? Where will the Jajjal come from? From that area, from the east, not from Saudi Arabia, from Khorasan, from Balkh, from Maru, from Iran, northeast of Iran. The Prophet said, والسلام, there will come people from the east. Now he's in Medina. His east is Iraq. They will recite the Quran and it would not pass their collarbones or their throats and they would exit from the deen as the arrow exits the prey these are what who are they khawarij where are they coming from from iraq so i hope this yani roughly answers it but if you ins still insist it's from saudi it's your choice it's not mine this is up to you We move on to the major signs, alhamdulillah, khalas. The little minor signs, we're through. Now we are left with 10 major signs. The Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, in the hadith of Hudayf ibn Usayt, he said, the Prophet looked at us while we were in a circle discussing, arguing, discussing in the masjid, and the Prophet would check on them. Are they playing cards? Are they talking about the latest entertainment, movies, etc.? This is what a murabbi does. This is what a teacher does. When you see your students doing something, not spying, but redirecting. You have to, your children, you don't spy on them. You have to bring matters to their attention. Maybe you will benefit them with, with something better. So the Prophet said, what are you doing? And they said, we're studying. We are trying to research and contemplate. It's brainstorming, O Prophet of Allah. So he said, on what? He, they said, we're brainstorming about the hour. So the Prophet gave them immediately the answer. He said, it will not be called. The hour will not come until you see 10 signs and he mentioned the smoke a dukhan a dajjal and the appearance or the rising of the sun from the west the descension or the, the descent that is of al masih isa ibn maryam peace be upon him gog and magog ya'juj wa ma'juj three line slides one in the east one in the west and one in the arabian peninsula then uh i think i missed one did i adaba yes number three sorry and adaba the beast and finally a fire that comes at the end of time from yemen and pushing the people to their mahshar. Where is the mahshar? In Asham, in Syria. These are the ten. Now, some of these ten signs we have extensive information about, and some we have only one line. So, again, this is not storytelling. 
This is fact finding. So we have to mention what is mentioned in the Quran and the Sunnah. And if not anything mentioned, you have to just believe in it and move on. Now, some of these things happen in sequence. So the Dajjal, Isa ibn Maryam, Ya'juj, Ma'juj, they all fall, happen one after the other. And the last would be the fire that takes people uh, from their homes into Syria. Where the landslides will happen, when the landslides would happen, this is in Allah's knowledge, we do not know of that. And among the last things, of course, is the rising of the sun from the west. So, why are these 10 so significant? We've mentioned maybe like 40, 50 signs before, yesterday and today. But why then these 10 so significant? The Prophet tells us والسلام, that these last 10 signs are like beads in a prayer beads, masbaha. Once you cut the string, everything falls and not one or two, everything falls. And this is how the last 10 signs would take place, one after the other and things, khalas. And once you see the first, you know that it's about to end. Now, I rearranged it, not according to time, but rather according to the mentioning of it and the listing of the Prophet so according to the hadith I have just mentioned to you, Hadith Hudayfa ibn Usayd al-Ghafari, may Allah be pleased with him. The first sign is ad dukhan Now what is this sign? Allah says in the Quran, what translates to, then wait. You for the day when the sky will bring forth a visible smoke covering the people. This is a painful torment. Now, the scholars are split into two opinions. One of them, led by Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, may Allah be pleased with him, say that this sign has already happened. When? Abdullah ibn Mas'ud says, this was at the time where the, when the Prophet was in Mecca, alayhi salatu wasalam, or at the time when he made dua in Medina, that Allah Azza wa Jal would make it drought, dry, and famine. So the people of Mecca used to come out of their homes so hungry, so thirsty, so weary and tired, they would look at the sky because of the hunger, they would see as if there's a cloud covering the sky and it's like smoke. You know when you travel in the desert you see mirage and there's no water. It's something like this. It's an illusion. So Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, may Allah be pleased with him, used to swear that this is a sign that took place at the time of the Prophet The vast majority of companions and scholars say no, this is not possible because Allah says visible smoke. And what these people saw was an illusion. Is something imagined by them due to their hunger and uh, 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 thirst. And this is the opinion of Ali ibn Abi Talib, Ibn Abbas, Ibn Umar, that this has not come yet. What information do we have? We only have the hadith where the Prophet says, when the, when the dukhan, when the smoke comes, it will take believers as if it's a flu while the disbelievers would make them blow up and grow in size and it will come from all exits and entrances in their body. So it would be something of an epidemic to them. The believers would not suffer from it except as it is a flu. Any more information? We can't. Of course, if you go into the books of Tafsir, you will find and they say tales and stories, but these are not authentic. So we cannot base 
our conviction and belief on something that is not authentic. Now, the second sign is the coming of the Dajjal. Who is the Dajjal? He is Al-Masih Al-Dajjal. And Al-Masih can be used with Isa ibn Maryam and it can be used with the Antichrist or the imposter Christ. What is meant by Masih? Masih from to wipe. So Isa was known to wipe over the blind and leopard and the deaf and the, and the ill and they would be what? Cured by the grace of Allah. Al-Dajjal, the Antichrist, the imposter, is known Masih, one, because he wipes the whole earth except Mecca and Medina in 40 days. So this guy is supersonic. Yeah, and this is something that is too difficult to, to imagine uh, and see. Another interpretation is that his eye is wiped out. So we know that one of his eyes, he cannot see, normal. And one of the other eyes is coming out and it's green and it's like marble. And we will come to the description later on, inshallah. Inshallah, you will not have to see it by the grace of Allah Azza wa Jal. Now, before the coming out of the Dajjal, there will be the appearance of Al-Mahdi. And who is Al-Mahdi? Al-Mahdi is one of the descendants of the Prophet ﷺ. His name is like the Prophet's name, Muhammad. His father's name is like the Prophet's father's name, Abdullah. So his name is Muhammad ibn Abdullah. The Prophet tells us that he is not a righteous person, that he was not a good Muslim, maybe a playboy, maybe rich, maybe not observing Salah, overnight. In one night, Allah Azza wa Jal flips him and he becomes righteous, practicing, knowledgeable to the extent that people follow him and to the extent that he becomes a fixer. So he fixes the communities and the Muslims and he calls them to Islam and people follow him and he will fill the world with justice and fairness as it was filled with injustice and oppression. This is the description by the Prophet He is a son of Fatima, which means that he is of the offspring of Ali because the Prophet had four daughters, right? And he had offspring from three of them. So we have Zainab had two of her sons. Uthman had Abdullah from one of the daughters. So there are other uh, 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 descendants, but the most prominent is that of Fatima. May Allah be pleased with her. The Prophet told us that he has a clear forehead and that his nose is yeah, any, uh, uh, Roman like, you know, standing and there's a small bent in the middle and that he will reign seven years. He will be a ruler for seven years. Of course, this has no relation to the Mahdi of who? Of the Shia. The Shia claim that they have 12 Imam beginning from Ali onwards. And this is why they are called and known as Al-Ithna Ashariya, Ja'fariya, or Imamiya, Imams. And they claim that number 12, he was six months old when he crawled into a tunnel and a cave about like maybe 12 centuries ago and he's still there. 12, uh, 1200 years. And they claim that they write to him letters, Ayatullah, La'natullah. They have, and, and he responds and they give verdicts to the Ummah. You have to attack 
Iraq, you have to attack Yemen, you have to attack, and they said, no, it's not me, this is Al-Mahdi. And they, all, they claim that he has a river of milk, a river of honey, and he's striving on that. Of course, we know that all of this is nonsense. Now, we come to the Ad-Dajjal, of his description. There are so many hadiths, authentic. But to list them would take a lot of time. So we will just highlight as much as possible so that we can finish, inshallah, this workshop tonight. First of all, it is the biggest, most toughest fitna seen by mankind. Imagine, the Prophet said, السلام, that since the time of Nuh, every messenger of Allah warned his people from his fitna. Which means that this is not easy, guys. This is serious stuff. And the Prophet والسلام, also told us that he will come, claims to be God. And when people do not believe him, he will go a little bit lower. He says, okay, I'm a messenger of Allah. Azzawajal. And people don't believe him. The Prophet told us that he is one-eyed. And he said, be careful. Your Lord is not one eyed. Allah Azza wa Jal does not have one eye, which means that the scholars obtain from this hadith that Allah has two eyes. And this is the feature that we agree. But how the eye is, we don't go into how or why or uh, uh, interpret it. We just say that believe in it as the Prophet described alayhi salatu wasalam. On his forehead is written kafir or kafara. Every mu'min, male and female, the moment they look at him, he would, they would see it printed on his forehead. The disbelievers will be blinded. They will not be able to read it or to know it. Description, he is short, bulky, red head. His hair is, is red, or his entire body co complexion is red. So he's white, reddish, but his hair is rough, curly maybe, but it is not soft. It is rough hair. His eye is one-sided. One of his, his right eye is normal, but he cannot see with it. His left eye, this is the one that is so big and wide that it is uh, uh, weird and it's green as if it's made of glass or marble. Um, he has a lot of hair. He is infertile. He does not have any offspring. I don't think he has the time. Uh, uh, where is he at the moment? The Prophet ﷺ told us in a very long hadith and this hadith was a story that the prophet told the companions about the dajjal and then tamim ad-dari a companion who was late in islam came to medina and told the prophet about what he had seen alayhi salatu uh, may allah be pleased with him in a journey at sea and the prophet was so happy that he went into the pulpit called the people to come and told them, I told you before, but now I'm going to tell it to you again, the story of Tamim al-Dari. So the companions of, uh, the, the, the scholars of Hadith say that this is the only Hadith that the Prophet narrated of a companion. Usually it is the companions narrating Hadith from the Prophet. This is the only incident that the Prophet himself said, Tamim al-Dari told me one, two, three, four, five. In short, what did Tamim al-Dari say? He said, before Islam, I was with 30 men on a boat and we were lost in sea for a whole month. And then it capsized. We took uh, 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 life rafts and means of survival and we went into an island. And then 
the moment we set uh, uh, shore, there came a beast, hairy. We don't know what's the front and what's the back. We can't figure out. It's, it's, it's even worse than a gorilla. So we were terrified. And they, uh, this uh, 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 beast called itself Al Jassasa. And the moment that beast saw us, it told us to go to that monastery because there's a man waiting and dying to hear from you. So they went and they found this great person chained from neck downwards in change in chains. So this was really scary again. So they said, what are you? He said, I'll tell you who I am. I'm not going anywhere, but you tell me and started asking them questions about the Prophet ﷺ, about the lake of Tabariya in Palestine, about an area with uh, 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 palm trees, etc. And then he told them about himself that he will come at the end of time when he's permitted, he will roam the earth in 40 days entering every country, every city, except Mecca and Medina. And the Prophet ﷺ addressed the companions, wasn't this what I told you before? The companions said, yes, O Prophet of Allah. This is exactly what you had told us before. Then the Prophet said, he is in the sea of Syria, of Sham, the Mediterranean. No. He is in the Sea of Yemen, the Indian Ocean, or the, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, Arabian, Gulf, Arabian Sea, I think. Huh? Then the Prophet said, no, he is at the east. He is at the east. He is at the east. Meaning that he is coming from that area. Why was the Prophet Hassan hesitant? Because the Wahi did not come. But in the final stage, when he confirmed, this is when Allah told him that he will come from the east. Before the coming from of, of, of the Dajjal, Allah Azza wa sends signs and tests to the people. There will come three years of extreme drought and famine for the whole world. In the first year, Allah tells the, the, the heavens to hold one third of the rain and for the earth to hold one third of the plants and the crops. The second, Allah orders it to hold two third, two third. In the third year, Allah orders the heavens and the earth not to produce anything. Now, what do we feed on? Either plants or animals. What do we drink? Water. So if we don't have this, what are the means of survival? This is exactly what the companions asked the Prophet of Allah. They said, Oh Prophet of Allah, in the last year when there's no water, no cattle, no grass to graze on, no plants, how will the people feed? How will they live? And the Prophet said, Alayhi salatu salam, by saying La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, walhamdulillah. This suffices them from actual physical food. Allahu Akbar. Look at the power of dhikr at the end of the time. So when you hear people say the world is overpopulated, we have to reduce reproductivity. We have to reduce the number of children we have so that the, the, the natural resources would suffice, we would tell them that this is a lie. Who is the Razzaq? Allah Azza wa So even if there is no food and there is no water, your dhikr suffices for that. Also before the Dajjal comes, one of the landmarks of the era would be the great battle between the Muslims and the Christians. Al-Malhamah Al-Kubra, it is called. And there, it will take place where? In Syria. 
And this is what made a lot of the Muslims nowadays say, it's happening. But this is not possible. You cannot interpret current situations with what? With hadiths of the Prophet ﷺ that this will happen because you can only interpret it after it happens. But to claim that this is what the Prophet said before it ends, this is not true. So this is what will happen. The Prophet said, first of all, you will have a covenant, you will have truce between the Muslims and the Christians, and then you will combine forces and attack a mutual enemy. The Prophet is telling, but not approving. Now when the Prophet tells you a prophecy, does this mean it's okay? When he tells us that the Dajjal is coming, does he, does he approve of it? Some people come to the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ saying that there will be security in the future until a woman travels alone from Sana'a to Hadramaut. So people come say, oh, this is an indication that it is permissible for a woman to travel without a mahram. Where did you bring this from? This is the Prophet said, the Prophet is telling you about a prophecy. Something will happen in the future. He told you in another hadith that this is haram for a woman to travel without a mahram. What are you doing? So likewise here, the Prophet is telling us that the Muslims and the Christians would combine forces to attack a mutual enemy. Now you do the math. Is this enemy the uh, Rafid Shia? Are they the Chinese? Are they the um, whatever power is there? Allah knows. This is not our job. Then you, of course, there are a number of versions of the hadith. You will be victorious and safe until you set your camp in a place of grazing with sand or uh, uh, the likes. One of your allies, the Christians, would raise the cross and say to everyone, we have been victorious because of the cross. A Muslim, hot-blooded Muslim, stands and breaks it. The Christians kill him. And the Muslims stand up to avenge their brother. And this is when the betrayal from the Christians happen and they gather their thousands and hundreds of thousands of soldiers to attack. There are so many hadiths about this battle that people call Armageddon. We don't have this uh, name in our uh, traditions. We have Al Malhama, which is the greatest battle of all. There is a description how such killings would take place uh, in, in the hadith that uh, Abdullah bin Mas'ud narrates, he said, the hour would not be called until wealth is not divided between the heirs and war booties people are not happy with. People usually are happy with war booties because when someone tells you that this is a, a, a Porsche 911 GTS 4, a gift, what would you do? Be happy, it's a gift, it's, it's booty. But there will come a time where people will not be happy. And then started to explain how the fight between the Muslims and the Christians will take place, how the amount of killing among the Muslims would take place until the family start to count the number of siblings and cousins and they would find only one out of a hundred. So they, Abdullah Musar said, so what kind of wealth they will be happy to distribute for the heirs and what kind of war booties that would come. And we spoke yesterday about the Christians being the majority of the people on earth at that moment. Now, the Dajjal would come after the Muslims are victorious and they win the battle against 
the Christians. This was difficult. It was not one without losses. A lot of the Muslims died. But eventually they will prevail and they will win. As they are just about to rest, what will happen? The shaitan calls the Dajjal is attacking your families, your women folk and your children. The Prophet said والسلام, they sent the Muslims 10 riders on horseback. The Prophet said والسلام, I know their names, the names of their fathers, the color of their horses. And this is one of the evidences that some scholars say indicate that at the end of the time everything would go back to old days horse riding swords bows and arrows and spears and the only logical explanation would be either there was an atomic bomb nuclear attack worldwide or there is no oil anymore because oil runs the electricity, the plastics, the industries. Once it's gone, everything goes back to square one. There's no wheel, there's no fossil fuel, there's nothing except how it used to be seven, eight, nine hundred years ago. And this is how it looks heading to. The oil is diminishing and inevitably the uh, uh, other sources of fuel is not that efficient in, 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 in fulfilling our needs. Okay, let's talk about the Dajjal again. Why would people be confused with him? The answer is, he's a cause of fitna. What is his fitna? We know everything about him. Ah, knowledge is not everything. One, the Prophet told us that he would commute from one place to the other in enormous speed. The Prophet said والسلام, that he will remain for only 40 days, but not a single country or town or city that he would not come and enter. So his fitna is everywhere. He would have a Jannah and Nar. He would have heaven or paradise and hellfire with him. So wherever he goes, you will see a river of fire and a river of cold water. And he will tell you, dip yourself in it. The Prophet says, alayhi salatu wasalam, I know what the Dajjal would come with. He will come with two rivers accompanying him. One of them is white water. You see that visibly. And the other one is raging fire. If anyone should see that, you must close your eyes, go to the raging fire and drink from it because it is cold water. Now, you know this hadith is narrated by uh, reported by Imam Muslim. You believe in it? Yes. When the tough gets going, the going gets tough. When the Jal comes with these two rivers and he travels like crazy and he has so many miracles coming to support him, this is when we start to shake up. I said, well, yeah, maybe he's right. Look. The guy tells, I will, I will come to some of the things that he is given by Allah as a test. He will use the devils. And how would he use the devils? He would go to the nomads, the Bedouins. He said, follow me. I'm your Lord. He said, what your Lord? La ilaha illallah. I'm a Muslim. Tawheed. Aqeedah. Takbir. Allahu Akbar. This is what he thinks. Then he says, okay, if I bring back to life your father and mother, would you believe me? I love my father. I love my mother. I haven't seen them for so many years. 
So all of a sudden, two devils come in front of him, looking like his father and mother. And they say, Oh my son, follow him. He is your Lord. He is Allah. Look at this fitna. Now you're hungry, you're thirsty, you haven't eaten, you're tired. And this thing comes to you with everything you want. What kind of Iman do you require to stay steadfast? He comes to people, he asks them to believe in him. So they do. They follow him and believe in him. What does he do? He orders the, the heavens to rain, it rains. He orders the earth to grow plants, it grows in front of their eyes. And their cattle grazes and becomes fat, milk, meat. And then he goes to another village and they refuse to follow him. So he orders the heavens and the earth and drought prevails and they have nothing in their hands except hunger. He passes by an area and he tells that area to get all of your fortunes and treasures out. The Prophet tells us والسلام, that he goes and all the treasures from the ground comes out following him and people are watching. Those who follow him, take whatever you want, gold, silver, take. He gives life to the dead. But this is a single incident. When he comes to Medina, there are angels carrying swords, protecting it. He cannot enter it. So he comes outside of it. A man, young man, comes out from Medina. The guards hold him up. Where are you going? He said, I'm going to see this imposter, Dajjal. So they start beating him. You're calling our Lord Dajjal, imposter? But then they say to one another, listen, listen, don't kill him. Our Lord said, do not do anything without consulting me. So they bring him to the Dajjal. And the Dajjal tells him, do you believe in me? And he says, I believe that you are the imposter that the Prophet told, you, told us about and that you are a liar. So the Prophet, so the Dajjal orders him to be tormented and flogged. So they flog him and do this and that. Again, he asks him, do you believe now in me? He said, I am a believer that you are the liar, imposter, the chap. So he brings a saw and he puts it on his head and he starts sawing him until he cuts him into two halves. And he walks between the two halves of his body with all the blood, with all the guts, with everything. And people are watching and seeing this. Then he says to the two halves, stand up. And all of a sudden in front of everybody else, he becomes a human being standing up. Nothing wrong with him. So he says to him, now do you believe in me? And the young man says, by Allah, now I am more aware of the truth of the Prophet Hassan, that you are the imposter he, whom he had warned us of. So he takes him to slaughter him like a cattle. Allah turns his neck into copper and he cannot kill him. He cannot harm him and he would not harm anyone else after that young man. And he's from Medina. So he takes his hands and legs and throw him into his river of fire. People think that he's dying. The Prophet says, he is going straight to Jannah and he's the greatest martyr at the side of Allah at that time. Where will he come from? The Prophet said in a hadith narrated by Abu Bakr, the Dajjal will come out from a land in the east called Khurasan. This is northeast of Iran, close to Afghanistan, Mar and Balkh, where the Mughals are with the faces like the hammered shields. 
How long he will stay? 40 days. One day is as long as a year. Another day is as long as a month. A third day is as long as a week. The remaining are what? 37 days. And these days, you have to calculate it to come up with some certain figure. The day, which is as long as a year, it is an actual year. But instead of the sun coming in 24 hours, it takes so long that a duration of a whole year. The companions asked of Prophet of Allah, in this day that is equivalent to a year, should we pray five prayers of a day? He said, no, you have to estimate, meaning that you have to pray the prayer of 360 days throughout that day which the sun would set in a full year and likewise with a month and likewise with a week and this is why the fatwa of the people in Sweden and Norway who have six months of daytime and six months of complete nighttime how would they pray because Maghrib is not due yet so six months alhamdulillah there is no Maghrib we wait until the sun sets no you have to look to the closest country that has a break of dawn and sunset and pray according to their timetable, according to their five prayers. Who will follow the Dajjal? I think we have five minutes more. Okay. So who are the followers of the Dajjal? The Prophet told us alayhi salatu wasalam, that the vast majority of the followers of the Dajjal are one, the Jews. Two, the non-Arabs, because they have problems with the language. You have to learn Arabic to become an Arab and be immune, inshallah. And those who are known as a Turk. So the Mughals, the people from the uh, Soviet uh, uh, states, who will follow them? The Bedouins, because even though they were Arabs, but they have zero knowledge of the religion. And women. The Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, the Jews, 70,000 of them with a special type of cloth called tayalisa, will follow the Dajjal. And as for the women, the Prophet told us alayhi salatu wasalam, that when the Dajjal approaches Medina and cannot enter it, camps outside of it, the vast majority of women would come out of Medina to follow him and believe in him. The Prophet says والسلام, to the extent that a man would go to his women folk, chain them to the house so that they do not leave. He would chain his mother, his daughter, his sister, his aunt, so that they would not come out and believe in the Dajjal authenticated by Ahmed Shakir. May Allah have mercy on his soul. So this is scary. And there is no discrimination. The sisters would say, hey, why, why us? Well, there, there are Turks, there are Mughals, there are the Bedouins, there are the uh, Jews, there are the uh, non-Arabs. Also, there are men, but women in general are weak by nature and this is a fact they can be easily manipulated with soft words and a good husband is the one who knows how to speak to his wife he could win her heart with a rose with a bottle of perfume with a dinner in a, a, a nice restaurant and he can lose her forever by saying harsh words or bad comments they and, and this is the beauty of of, of women you know, imagine yourself marrying a man Ugh. it's really boring so yeah this is the nature men are from venus or women are from venus and and and, and men are from mars so they have to understand but this vulnerability this weakness is something 
that is natural and that is why they have to be careful about this so i think we will stop here inshallah and uh, uh, prepare for the salat wallahu a'lam wa nisbatul ilmi lihi aslam wa sallallahu sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyina muhammad